Britain, 1967, UF wave. 1967 could be high-profile UFO counters across the USA, for Canada and much of Europe. Counters that have such an effect, some are still remembered and even celebrated today. However, despite the US government in particular having a vast number of resources directed towards the study of such sightings at the time, this surprisingly Dion played the wave instead of performing any kind of semantic investigation as at these sightings we know were stacking up privately and isolated each other in 1967. There were open debates taking place in the US Congress with serious arguments from highly educated and figures for the most part on both sides. Despite this, no connections or interlocking study was made. Though exact figures vary marginally, there were more over 4,000 sightings of UFOs in the United States alone in 1967, compared with little in the first reports in the second busy year of six, six, 1966. Only many reports in 1967, more than 100 speak of contact or sightings of humanoid entities, presumably extraterrestrials. Despite all this, it appeared this openness was a convenient way of drawing attention away from a real prize, you know, uh, uh, the ultimate of taking an official start of dismissing the validity of such claims, leading to often often offered by highly dubious explanations, such as swamp gas or weather balloons. The Falcon Lake Incident, May 1967 Sometimes referred as a milk lake encounter, the events of 20th of May 1967. On the day in question, 51-year-old mechanic Stephen McCall was roaming in the rocky wildlands near Falcon Lake in search of rare, valuable, or just interesting minerals. He was in the boundaries of White Shell Provincial Park in Matatoba, region of Canada, around 80 miles from his home in Winnipeg. He was examining what he believed to be a quartz crystal. It suddenly noticed a colour pony of noise, cacophony of noise from the wildlife around him. He looked in upwards and through, and through the trees. He could certainly see two glowing red oval shaped objects. What's more, they were heading his way with old elasticity. One of the objects would come to rest on his outcrop of rocks about around 160 feet from where he stood. The other would hover over him a distance of approximately 15 feet. In a, it then shot up, upwards into the air at great speed. The object on the rocks remained where it was, as did Manorick. He noticed a great heat filling the air around him. The object would change colours several times, going from red to grey to then to hot. Staying, staying still in a glowing golden glow around it. After f- around 30 minutes, the door opened. Ladies described the door as square but round edges. Mike would state that the bright purple light will come from inside a craft. He also felt wafts of warm air washing all over him, as well as his stink smell of sulfur. This last point is particularly interesting. It is often found within many close encounter reports. You will also hear a high buzzing sound, like a tiny electric motor running very fast. He made his way towards the craft. The nearer he got, the more he could make out. What he eventually realised was voices. They sounded human, if very high pitched. He called out several different languages, including English, Russian, French, Italian, and Ukrainian, in an effort to communicate. All went unanswered. He moved closer to the strange craft. Now so close he could touch it, placing his protective glasses he used for tripping rocks, he made a decision to look inside. Took a breath, he reached his head inside the doorway. A maze of lights would greet him, some flashing repeatedly. There were also direct beams running into horizontal and diagonal paths. To him, there appeared to be no design or pattern or draw the lights, which appeared to be working in a random fashion. He turned his attention to the ground, noticing no seams or joins on it from the walls above. Again, this is a detail that arises in many UFO cases. Just as he was about to take a closer look, the ship tilted somewhat. 
The tilt caused one of the machines of the craft to make contact with his chest. He instantly felt an intense searing pain to his total. On even more concern was his glove, which had melted from his hand and his shirt was in flames. He fell away from the craft, removing his shirt as he did so. He noticed the craft had slightly risen from the ground. Then a rush of hot air hit him. The object vanished upwards. Micklick took a moment to gather his thoughts, confused in great pain, going to make his way to his vehicle parked on the highway. He would drive to Misa Coldonia Hospital, where he was treated for severe chest burns. He would report the encounter to Royal Canadian Mounted Police, although they did little more than make a basic report. When local media and local radio become aware of the incident, however, several UFO investigators would descend on the area, eager to talk to Mitlick and investigate the incident further. Mitlick himself still had a bizarre, checkered burn on his chest, presumably where he fell against the machinery inside. Mitlick remained severely ill for several weeks following the incident. He would suffer from intense nausea and struggle to keep any food in his system. He also did a nasty blister to the do so several weeks after the incident, as well as bizarre rash that ran in a V-shape from his ears to his chest. Although his health would return to normal after a month or so, he would suffer flare-ups of ill health for some time. In September 1967, for example, he would attend the hospital again due to several strange large spots appearing on his torso as well as intense burning feeling around his neck and chest. Furthermore, he would suffer random episodes of dizziness. His joints around his hands would swell considerably. After initially showing little interest in his gout, following pressure from the UFO researchers as well as genuine interest in the case by public, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and the Canadian Air Force would investigate the matter more seriously. During this investigation, Matt Lake alone would investigate his an electrical engineer would locate the site of the incident. To surprise to everyone, a clear outline of the ship remained on the ground for all to see. They would also recover the remains of the burnt shirt that Menrick ripped off his back before they falling back from the craft. It was noticed that the tree and palms in the immediate vicinity of the landing spot of the craft were withered and dead. Ultimately, the incident of Falk Lake remains a mystery, but many in the UFO field fields regard Medlick as a very credible witness. His story of indicated and genuine. Medlick passed away in October 1999, 32 years after the incident at the age of 83. You've been listening to Area 52. Forgotten 1967 UFO Waves.